Hello, everyone. Wonderful again to see you all uh, logging in from all over the country and all over the world. And I'm excited to be back with Dr. McDougall this week. We had a wonderful guest last week. It was Dr. Doug Lyle. And today we're continuing with the series that is called uh, Dr. McDougall's Medicine. And today he's going to talk to us about urinary disease. And we have some questions. And of course, as usually, you can all type questions in the chat box. So how are you doing, Dr. McDougall in California? Well, I'm alive and well. Actually, uh, good. <laughs> That's doing really well. Doing really well. Uh, good. We just finished a big program, and uh, Mary is just uh, just finished with her Christmas stuff. Mary's uh, just a a real Christmas fanatic. She has been her whole life, and particularly since we had children. I, I mean, at Christmas at the McDougal's house, uh, people say that uh, they'd like to join our family <laughs> because she is. <laughs> She's just so enthused. She's got like a uh, she's got like an eleven foot tree, and uh, wow, yeah, and and of course, there's never enough presents for Mary to buy the kids, which has been never a, a matter of contention. Imagine. <laughs> yeah, uh, we all eat the same. We all seem to have similar interests. Now that is a blessing, yes, because a lot of families have to deal at this time of year oh, with, yeah. with yeah. you know yeah, that's different foods, and it's very difficult. Wow, well, you know that's what, wonderful. I'm so glad. Well, you know what Mary's advice and my advice is to you when you go to Christmas parties or you go to Christmas dinners or whatever, you know, eat before you go and then just kind of That's pick right. among the things. And, uh, you know, if you have to, just tell them it's doctor's orders. Dr. John McDougall, listen to me carefully. Dr. John McDougall officially told you not to eat those bad foods. So you tell him you have the meanest SOB of a doctor in the whole world. And he told you, I can't eat that stuff. <laughs> No, whatever. You, you just, uh, and then again, you may decide you want to make yourself sick for a day. You know, if you're over 21 and you're uh, well educated enough, you certainly have that option to do whatever you want with your body. But at least you know. So the, the holidays are here, and uh, I'm glad I'm back with you. I had a, a few things I had to take care of this past week, and let's see, I'm not doing anything until January 6th when we started a new program. And we'll have probably 30 to 50 people there. And then Hawaii, I, I promise you, Kauai is sold out. I know for a long time I've been telling you it's been sold out, but I knew Mary is keeping a room or two behind. It's still sold out now with a big waiting list. Uh, so you know, Kauai will be a great time. Uh, we will miss you. Uh, of course, Gustavo, you're going to be there. And uh, we've already started to launch trips for 2018. We're not going to do another trip for 2017. We're not going to do one in the summer, but we are going to do two in 2018. Uh, great trips. So just uh, you know, put the money into the mattress and uh, <clears throat> get ready for a once in a lifetime experience. So um, I'll give you a hint. One of the trips you go on may be the last time you ever see ice in this part of the world. Oh. oh. So, uh, so I'm not being you know, any more specific than that. <laughs> And the other one is uh, also going to be in the United States, uh, but uh, it's at uh, probably at one of our favorite places in the world where Mary and I actually started our life. But those are the only hints I'm going to give you for 2018. They're the process right. being planned now. And of course, the ship we take you to see the last ice on Earth only holds 62 people. So. So that's, uh, yeah, that's a small group. Well, we're looking forward to more details. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think last time we talked, I had a chance to talk to you about my last newsletter. Didn't we talk about our president-elect? And uh, I, I think a lot of people are coming to the same conclusion I am is, uh, you know, we just kind of hope for the best. Uh, that uh, somehow, uh, and I, I, I do have to take this attitude, somehow bringing the issues onto the table rather than having them be ignored. As I told you in that newsletter, uh, Barack Obama, he was Barry when I first met him, Barry Obama, he was 15 years old. Uh, he knew uh, all about the McDougal program. He took classes from me. We talked about it personally when he was 15. Uh, his wife knew about uh, uh, the health importance of a, a, a diet like we recommend. She's vegan. There are other, other people in politics who know the truth and, you know, no, no change was made. Uh, and I have to believe, I don't know politics and I don't really want to know politics. But I have, to, I have to believe this is because of uh, pressure and pol uh, politics from the 
various big industries, the drug companies, big medicine, you know, big farm, big food. And so per virtually nothing was changed. Well, we have a whole new uh, leader. So at least things are going to get on the table. And maybe that's what we need. It's just a big open fight. I think we do to get uh, things turned around. But that's, that's yeah, kind of yeah. the way I look at things every day is, is uh, we have a new world coming. And uh, maybe the truth that is undeniable, and I've shared with you, and any of you who've looked into it know it's undeniable, maybe that truth will get up for discussion. Uh, anyway, I'm glad to be back. Uh, we're, next week, we're going to talk about arthritis. We kind of got our schedule mixed up. But next week, we plan on talking about arthritis, uh, rheumatoid, osteoarthritis, uh, lupus, those kinds of things, which are, are diseases I have a lot of fun treating because they respond so well, uh, particularly rheumatoid. Lupus takes a little longer, uh, lupus arthritis. Of course, lupus involves the kidneys, which is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, they're basically the same processes uh, in terms of cause of disease. It's just that in one situation, the uh, reaction affects the joints more than other parts of the body. But still, people with lupus classically have kidney troubles, skin trouble, and arthritis trouble. And people with rheumatoid arthritis commonly have other autoimmune diseases, including kidney disease. And so they're, they're basically the same mechanism, one dominantly affecting the kidneys, the other dominantly affecting the uh, the joints. So there's a lot of tie-in. And of course, I ask you to read. And every time I read this book, it shocks me that I wrote this book 35 years ago. And uh, there's virtually nothing I would have to change. And all the basics are there. Uh, all the basics that you'd have to know or should know if you're a researcher or a doctor and you're treating kidney disease or doing uh, current research on kidney disease, because you have to have the basics. And the basics are in this book. And uh, it's been out probably 30, 35 years, and I've never had a, a reason, no one's ever commented on any change that I should make in this entire book, which talks about things from kidney disease to cancer and so on. And so uh, I got it right the first time. And the reason I did is the truth is the truth, and the scientific research was adequate enough uh, in the mid-1980s to publish this book. So I hope you re have been reading chapters along with it. Uh, this book can be found in used bookstores for probably 50 cents. And it be, can be downloaded on my from my website as a PDF file for $10. Uh, it is, uh, in many ways, the most important book I've written, but I don't think it'll ever get recognition. Uh, uh, oh, before I go on with the discuss of kidney disease, which I'm going to do, believe me, I just want to recognize the passing of one of my good friends, Henry Heimlich, MD, uh, the inventor of the Heimlich maneuver and the inventor of the Heimlich chest tube. Uh, he has saved more lives than any person in all of human history. Henry Heimlich has, and he died last week. Uh, he was 93 years old. I'm going to do a uh, newsletter honoring him uh, at the end of this month, December 2016. He was uh, one of two men I could hardly wait to hear the next word out of their mouth. When I just sat there waiting to hear what came next, and Henry Heimlich was one of them. Uh, to satisfy your curiosity, most of you who follow me know the other was Nathan Pritikin. So Henry Heimlich, uh, he lived a good life. He lived uh, an important life. He was a pioneer. He was uh, fought uh, by the uh, American Blood Association, American Heart Association. They all fought him for the Heimlich maneuver because of ego. And as a result, uh, tens of thousands of people have died because they haven't learned the Heimlich maneuver. Same thing with drowning. Tens of, tens of thousands of people have drowned unnecessarily because they haven't learned the Heimlich maneuver. Anyway, we're going to talk about Henry Heimlich uh, more after the newsletter comes out in December, end of December 2016. <clears throat> There's already a uh, TV show someplace up on the um, up on YouTube of a TV show I did with Henry Heimlich on my television show, or it will be talked about in the next newsletter. You'll have a link to that uh, that TV show. And also uh, interviews I did with him in a, t a radio interview I did with Henry Heimlich. All right, so the uh, discussion today is kidney disease. I take care of a lot of people with kidney disease. Uh, kidney stones, very common. Uh, people tell me that the worst pain that they've ever suffered from is kidney stones. And um, I have to tell you that I know uh, people who, uh, one person in particular who uh, espouses a healthy diet who uh, just had kidney stones 
and he or she uh, probably did know the cause, should have known the cause, but told me it was the most painful thing he or she ever had. And, uh, you know, worse than childbirth. And there's no question in my mind why he or she got the kidney stones, because I've seen the way he or she eats, even though he or she recommends a healthy diet. You know, you can't eat that much seafood and protein and uh, end up with anything but kidney stones. Well, kidney stones are uh, caused as a result of eating the high Western, high, the rich Western diet. Uh, the primary culprit factor is the protein and the, uh, the meat protein, animal proteins, which are very acidic. This goes back to our story about bones. When you eat a high acid diet, the bones have to dissolve. And when they dissolve, what happens is uh, the bone material goes into the bloodstream and then it's filtered out in the kidney system. And there in the kidney system, some of the, uh, some of the minerals and other bone uh, components, they solidify into kidney stones. And uh, calcium is a big component, but the other component of most kidney stones on the American diet is oxalate. Now you say, well, oxalate, that comes from spinach and greens and so on. So you shouldn't eat a high oxalate diet. Well, no, that's not where it comes from. Yes, these greens are very high in oxalate, but the oxalates combine as a calcium oxalate in the plant and it's non-absorbable. It goes, passes through the intestinal tract without being absorbed, the oxalate does unless you eat a high fat diet. A high fat diet, I'm talking about vegetable fat or animal fat, takes and does something called saponification. It soaps the calcium out and frees up the oxalate. So now that's absorbed into the bloodstream and is filtered through the kidney system. So there you have the components of calcium kidney stones. You have the calcium and the oxalate, you have the acidic urine, you throw in a little uric acid and that's how you get the kidney stones. And that's what most kidney stones are. They're 100% preventable. Uh, there was an article published in, what was it, 19, I don't know, probably 1978, 1982, uh, in the British Journal of Urology titled, uh, Should uh, ki uh, Recurrent Kidney Stone Formers Become Vegetarians? And that was in the British Journal of Urology. I mean, we've known this forever. <clears throat> my, uh, uh, one of my best friends who happens to, uh, used to live next to me, uh, had an uh, episode of kidney stones and um, terrible pain. And I was called over at two o'clock in the morning and I looked at him laying on the bathroom floor, throwing up in horrible pain and told his wife, well, you need to take him to the hospital, get some narcotics until he passes the stone because that's what he's got, a stone. I can't do anything. So after this horrible episode, he came to talk to me and said, well, what causes kidney stones? And I gave him a stack of literature about how the Western diet, particularly the protein and acid component cause kidney stones. I printed out this whole stack for him. He went to see his urologist on uh, the regular follow-up visit, slapped the stack down in front of the urologist and said, why didn't you tell me what causes kidney stones? The urologist says, that's not my job. My job is to take out kidney stones, not to tell you how to prevent them. And that's the truth, that's his job. You know, his job is to take it when you're in dire need to break up those kidney stones, stick a, a tube up your urethra into your ureter and uh, pull that kidney stone out or crush it, whatever. That's his job. So my uh, friend was offended, but I told him that's his job. You know, he's telling you what he does. He doesn't care whether you get another kidney stone or not. That's his, not his job. Anyway, my friend had uh, uh, another couple of episodes of kidney stones and then decided it wasn't worth it to change his diet. So that's how you get kidney stones. The, uh, uh, one of the more common and important issues of kidneys that has to do with a disease called glomerular nephritis, glomerular nephritis, those are little blood vessels in your kidneys. What happens is the body attacks these blood vessels. And I printed out this article in color for you, I think. Let's see. Uh, these are pictures of the glomeruli. You don't see them, but when you look in there, you'll see them in a nice green color. And uh, you'll see the glomeruli all lit up with uh, antibodies that are directed to cow milk protein. The title of this article is Early Childhood Membranous Nephropathy Due to Catonic Bovine Serum Albumin. In other words, these kids had failing kidneys because the kidneys were being attacked by antibodies that were produced by drinking cow's milk. And these kids were dying, they were four of them, from this disease. You die from this disease, I mean, you maybe last 10 years. Uh, but, uh, Anyway, they studied, this is 2011, the New England Journal of Medicine, ladies and gentlemen. This is not like some 
our cave journal or like the things that I talked to you about in this book that say the exact same thing from the 1970s and 80s. It says the exact same thing just with higher technology. So anyway, you go to the doctor and you have a kidney disease, a membranous nephropathy, say due to lupus or uh, no, whatever autoimmune disease. This will never be mentioned to you, never. And I want you to know that the kids in this particular study, the four, where they identified antibodies that attack cow's milk, attacking the kidneys, they took the four kids off the milk and they were cured. Why isn't this part of general medical practice? Oh, well, it's because, because you, we've talked about this many times before, but it's a crime. You know, it'd be like uh, going to a kidney uh, specialist and uh, having diabetes or high blood pressure and the doctor say, well, I'm not gonna treat it. Uh, by the way, the benefits are small from the drug treatment but with, diet, with high blood pressure and diabetes, but let's just say they're there. And said, I'm not gonna treat it. And then you died of kidney disease and your wife went and sued him because they didn't mention that the diabetes and high blood pressure should have been treated with drugs. Well, it's the same darn thing. You have a child, and these children, you know, or young children, you have a child dying from uh, glomerular nephritis or nephropathy, any other kidney disease, and the doctor fails to mention that cow's milk causes this. Okay, it says so right here in the June 2nd, 2011 New England Journal of Medicine, that cow's milk causes this, and you didn't tell me to take my child off of cow's milk and cheese and other milk and put them on a good diet. You didn't tell me that. Excuse me, I want you to meet my attorney. This is malpractice. This is malpractice and the worst degree you can get. Failing to offer a non-toxic, no cost, 100% curable therapy to your patients. Okay, so anyway, uh, it's not just cow milk protein, it's pork and beef and maybe, maybe in rare cases, uh, uh, plant foods could be involved, especially when you're dealing with celiac disease, which lets a lot of uh, proteins go through the gut wall into the intestine. So you really need a clean diet and you can stop this. You can stop this inflammatory kidney disease. By the way, it's the same diet that stops the inflammation in the joints because in that case, the antibodies to cow milk are attacking the joints predominantly or the skin like within lupus, you get them attacking the skin. It's all the same basic mechanism. Animal protein, which is foreign protein, goes into the blood. The body says, the immune system says, this is foreign protein, I'm gonna make antibodies to it. So it makes antibodies to cow or pig protein or whatever. And these antibodies cross react with your own tissues because you're an animal. So you have similar proteins in your tissues like your kidneys and your joints and you know, eyes and all kinds of places, brain, multiple sclerosis we're talking about. You have similar proteins to pigs and cows and chickens. And so when the body makes antibodies to these foreign proteins, these animal proteins, you know, the food, then these proteins cross react. It's called molecular mimicry and then attack your own body tissues. All right. Well, okay. Let me just stress just a couple more things and then we'll get on with questions. Uh, one thing has to do with any kind of kidney disease, whether you lost your kidney in a car accident or you donated your kidney to a relative or uh, you got an infection and lost some of your kidney or a stone blocked your kidney and destroyed some of the kidney or uh, uh, whatever, you had a heart attack in your kidney uh, from atherosclerosis. No matter how, what, for what reason you lost kidney function, you need to be on a, a low protein diet and science is clear on this, but it has been corrupted by industry, by the way. Uh, but the basic science is clear that high protein diets, when you eat excess protein, it has to go someplace. It doesn't go into your muscles. If it went into your muscles, we'd all look like Arnold Schwarzenegger used to look like. It doesn't get stored in the muscles and it must be uh, metabolized in the liver and the kidneys and it's lost through the kidneys, that excess protein. Remember when you have asparagus and you pee in the toilet, it stinks of asparagine, which is an amino acid. That's where the protein goes in the kidneys. So when you eat excess protein, the body has to increase the flows and the pressures in the nephrons, another part of the kidneys. And the process of increasing flows and pressures, you destroy kidney tissue. In fact, a otherwise healthy person you know, who has no evidence of any disease at all, just by eating the American diet, they lose about half their kidney function by the time they're in their, by the, by the time they're my age, 70 years old, half their kidney function is gone just from the wear and tear of the Western diet. But that's okay because you only need 25% of your kidney function to filter all of the junk that you eat. 
So at 50% loss, you don't even notice it. But you take somebody who's lost 50% of their kidney function, say they've donated a kidney or lost it in an accident. Now you only get dealing with 50% of the kidney mass, then that increased filtration and pressure that occurs from excess protein intake rapidly damages the kidney and sends you off to a dialysis machine. It has been known for a hundred years, what I'm telling you. And it's also been known that you can slop, excuse, slop, stop or slow the progression of kidney disease by simply changing your diet to a low protein diet. Now we're not talking about the kind of diet that I recommend exactly, just the direction, just low protein, okay? So they do cut out a lot of the meats and the other protein foods, but they don't really get the starch-based part. So the patients are starving, they're doing something unnatural, tasteless, and so on with these uh, protein supplement formulas they give along with a low protein diet, just a, a miserable thing that no, no one really wants to or can do or no doctor can prescribe with enthusiasm. Uh, the real way to stop it is like Walter Kempner used to do. And I've talked about Kempner and the rice diet. Uh, in fact, Kempner's diet is the most ideal diet for uh, damaged kidneys. But short of that, the diet I recommend is pretty darn close to the Kempner diet. It's a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. You want to reduce your intake of beans, peas, and lentils because they're high in protein. They're 30% protein as opposed to, say, um, sweet potatoes that are 6% or uh, rice that's 10% or uh, oatmeal that's 16%. Beans, peas, and lentils are 30% protein. So if you have failing kidneys, you want to cut down on the beans, peas, and lentils. Also, your non-starchy vegetables, like lettuce, I think is 35% protein, even though you don't eat very much. I mean, these non-starchy greeny yellow vegetables are high protein. So you may even want to incre increase your intake of sugar intake. You know, Kempner often, not often, but sometimes had to make half the diet table sugar because the kidneys were in such damage uh, that they couldn't take the, any more protein. Uh, uh, as far as uh, preserving their function. So we had to cut the protein content of rice, which is 5% of the calories, down to about 2 to 3% of the calories with sugar. So uh, anyway, you, you want to, uh, if you don't have kidney disease, you don't want to eat a high protein diet. As I told you, uh, if I mentioned his or her name, you'd all go, whoa! But uh, there are some advocates of healthy eating out there that they themselves eat high protein diets. And he or she, as a result of consuming large amounts of seafood and other things, uh, result in having a, a kidney stone episode. So uh, even if you think you're a health food person, you really know the message. You really have to do this. A starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. I've recommended limiting beans, peas, and lentils to one cup cooked a day. You know, maybe you have two cups one day and no cups the next day. I just don't want you eating beans, peas, and lentils every day, all day long. Uh, even though they're vegetable protein, which is healthier on the kidneys than animal protein, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's it's not, uh, well, let's just say I offer some caution in that direction, is uh, even if you don't have kidney disease, beans, peas, and lentils are rich in protein, so make them a cup a day cooked on average. If you have kidney disease, you have to cut it down even more. So uh, even people with polycystic kidney disease, as they say, loss from donation or accident or uh, past infection or whatever the reason, if you eat a low protein diet, you will decrease pressures and flows in the nephrons, which will preserve your kidneys, which will keep you off the dialysis machine longer, if not forever. But your doctor will not teach you that. Even though the science is there, you look uh, around your town, if you're in any sizable town, you've got many uh, di uh, dialysis clinics that earn millions of dollars uh, doing dialysis. They have, uh, I think they're being mean or deceptive, uh, that's their job. Remember like my neighbor and the urologist, his job is taking out stones. Their job is, is to filter you, uh, your kidneys with a kidney dialysis machine. That's their job. It's not how to tell you to be healthy. In fact, when you go to one of those dialysis wards, you walk in and they tell you, we'll just suck everything out of you that you eat. It doesn't matter what you eat. We'll just suck it out. Well, that's not true. They don't just suck it out. In fact, kidney patients on dialysis machines have a very, in fact, our most common cause of death is atherosclerosis, like heart attacks and strokes. They suck some things out, like the protein, the potassium, and a few other things, but they don't suck out all the toxins. They certainly don't provide the life-sustaining materials that you need from a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. 
So there's a lot to read, both in the book I wrote and in the article I wrote in my uh, newsletter that I ask you to read as homework. I told you to get that uh, article from the New England Journal of Medicine, which is June 2002, 2011. This is, I think, I think it's uh, open access. You can just get it. If not, you can go to your library. They'll print it out for you. My July 2007 newsletter is all about diet and kidney disease. Uh, let's see. I think that's the bulk of what I wanted to cover. Maybe one other thing is uh, there's a section in there I put in that uh, was only a, a small si a small phase in medical care. Uh, it was about bladder infections. And I wrote a little a piece in there about it. In fact, this must have been 35 years ago. There were some studies done showing that you could take one day of antibiotic if you got an infection, a double dose, one day, one dose, there's a double dose of a common antibiotic, and you get the same results as taking four tablets a day for 10 days. It's called single dose therapy. Well, that never became popular because, I mean, compare, you know, compare uh, two pills versus 40 pills. I mean, what are the drug companies and doctors going to recommend? Two pills versus 40 pills. Well, it, it's still a way I treat my patients. I treat them with one, one dose. There's also some talk about in there about uh, cranberry juice, cranberry juice pills, blackberry. It's the same thing. Uh, people with <clears throat> urinary tract infections, uh, it does work, even though current research seems to indicate it doesn't work. I still believe it does work to take a high dose of these uh, juices or pills. Uh, there's mechanisms worked out that show that they stop urinary tract infections and even help cure them. And people with chronic urinary tract infections, that might be something to consider. You buy them in a natural food store or a grocery store, you buy the juice. So let's see. I think that's probably a good general overview. You need to protect your kidneys. Uh, life without kidneys, uh, living in a dialysis machine is like, uh, it's like hell on earth. If you need to be convinced that you need to eat a healthy diet and you have a failing kidneys, say your creatinine is above 1.2, uh, your doctor says, and by the way, when your creatinine is about 1.2, you've lost half your kidney function at least. Uh, you need some convincing that you need to eat well. Ask your doctor or you know, call up one of these dialysis units and ask them if you can come and have a tour. You can have a tour and then go home and see how tasty that steak is or that pork chop. And decide whether or not you'd like to live on sweet potatoes without a dialysis machine or rice without a dialysis machine or you'd like, rather eat your triple, double, all-American cheese, hot dog, bacon, burger. You decide. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have been, I have seen the dial, dialysis. Been, oh, God. Yeah. Oh, you know, what, what, when, they, when, they, when history writes itself, if it ever does, uh, they're going to uh, take pictures of dialysis wards and chemotherapy wards. And they're going to identify these as torture chambers. Uh huh. Right. Which, by the way, I'm not just not trying to say that they don't sometimes save lives. And certainly, you need these machines if you have no kidneys. But uh, you know, when you could have prevented, you could have prevented, like this New England Journal of Medicine article says, you could have prevented this child or adult from going on with further kidney dissection and requiring a machine and life in this dialysis unit. And then you ought to offer some serious criticism about the past care patients and what we did to them rather than the right thing. A la our new president elect, at least he's gonna throw it on the table. Exactly. You know, and, I hope, and I hope I'm on stage, I hope I'm on stage to make my point of view. And I'd be glad to challenge everybody as we always do to join us on this webinar, or if they ever do, let me have the stage. Which Henry Heimlich told me, now I'll end here with questions since I brought up Henry Heimlich. And I'll talk about this in the newsletter. He gave me so many words of wisdom. But back in about 1991, I was planning on doing an infomercial, which is where, you know, I'm on <coughs> television. And uh, what I'm doing is uh, trying to sell products to tell people to buy, you know, my tapes and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, I'm thinking about this. Here I am. I'm a uh, right. I'm a and uh, I got Henry Heimlich. By the way, when Henry Heimlich got sick, this is the man who saved more lives than anybody else on earth. When he got sick, he came to me to get well. And one of my greatest honors in life. But Henry Heimlich and I, Hank, I, I never called him Hank. I always called him Dr. Heimlich. That's one of the things about uh, my, my mentors is I never called them by their first name. It was always Dr. Swank. It was always uh, Mr. Pritikin. It was always... Uh, I never got to meet Dr. Kempner, but it was always uh, Dr. Heimlich and so on. Well, 
Dr. Heinrich Hank, he told me, he says, John, when I was considering doing an infomercial, which would have made me a very disrespectful doctor, uh, Dr. Heinrich told me, he says, John, he says, you need to run around them. They are never going to give you the stage. So whatever you can do to run around them, do it. Don't expect them to accept you into, into th their fold because they see you as a threat. They will never give you an opportunity to share what you know, run around them. And so based on that, what Heimlich told me, I ran around them. I did uh, one infomercial that was number 12 in the United States. That was uh, back in about 92. And uh, I did a couple of other infomercials that were kind of flops, but anyway, I, I would do anything. I would, I would strip naked, put a tattoo on my chest that says, do not cath, I will sue. I will do whatever it requires to get you to listen to what I have to say. Uh, anyway, so Dr. Right, it's still, you know, it's mind boggling to, to most of us that doctors um, are not sharing this information that is old, like you're saying, and it's yeah. scientific and that they think that their job is to just uh, do surgery. I mean, it's, yeah. Uh, well, that, that's that's what they, they that's honestly what they do. They're people just like you and I. These are not bad people. They're just people. Right. So when they go to medical school, nine out of ten of them go into a specialty because that's where the bucks are. You know, your your medical school is a trade school. They teach you a trade: how to take out kidney stones, how to do heart catheterizations, how to do bypass surgery. Uh, this is a trade business. It's not. It has nothing to do with intelligence. I I have uh, grandchildren that are eight years old that could do everything any of your doctors do. Uh, I could train them and, and probably less time than they took to learn how to do it. Eight years old, this is like a cookbook. This is like playing a video game. It takes no thought at all. So anyway, medical schools are initially responsible. And of course I tried to get a law passed. In fact, I did get a law passed in September, 2011, SB 380, which forces medical schools to teach their students about nutrition and forces doctors to learn about nutrition. However, they're breaking the law every day. And I kind of leave that to somebody else to pick up the law, SB 380, carry it forward and make your doctors and your colleagues obey the law because they're not right now. Uh, so yeah, it seems overwhelming, but you know, uh, doing the right thing takes a lot of time. Right. Cause you have to talk to people. You have to talk about something you know nothing about Doctors know nothing about human nutrition. You also have to talk against your own dinner plate because tonight after you're done doing your third heart surgery, you have to go down and sit, to a, sit down to a, a, a tri-tip steak and a, and a right. glass of milk that uh, your, uh, your uh, homemaker prepared for you. So you go, my goodness, uh, if this is all that bad, why would I be eating this? You know, I'm confused. I have this research that says that these foods are clogging my arteries, killing my kidneys, killing my brain, killing my our joints. I have these articles. I'm confused because in this hand, uh, oops, this hand, I got a fork and spoon that's shoveling cholesterol and fat in my mouth. I'm confused. I don't understand. I'm confused. And and so that's the problem with your dietitians and doctors is they're confused and they're ignorant. And uh, that can all be changed. All our president-elect is going to put it on the table. We're going to make America great again. And we're going to do it by... <laughs> looking at the truth and the science and, and stop big farm and stop big food and stop big medicine. And I'm 70 years old. I, I, I'm nearly 70 years old. I can say that because. <laughs> yes, you can. I, can. <laughs> I mean, 20 years in prison would not be that bad. At least it's not. Important. No. Well, Dr. McDougall, let's, let's do some questions because no, we I have don't. some really good ones. That's okay. We have several people have, um, given us this question uh, on the same topic interstitial cystitis i think it's uh, called and or or the painful bladder syndrome if you would talk yeah that, that's a, a tough bit. one interstitial cystitis interstitial cystitis and i have a lot of patients who have that and i've tried to treat it over the years and i can't say with great success i do have some patients who believe that the change in diet particularly getting rid of the dairy dairy is always the big issue uh, made a huge difference in their life. Uh, but I have a lot of people that I remember from the past who have to tell me they didn't succeed with interstitial cystitis. Now, I, I wouldn't give up on dietary efforts uh, until you tried the elimination diet for at least four months. 
but you know, I, I have to give you my clinical experience, which has been mixed in terms of people coming back and saying, well, solve that painful problem I've suffered from the last 20 years. Uh, I can think of people who have told me clear, plain and simple, they, they really tried their best, which I assume is they did what I suggested and it didn't solve it. And I've had other people who say, you know, I think of actually quite several people who have said, yes, it has solved the problem. What do you got to lose? It doesn't cost you anything. You know, give you a good bowel movement. Cut your food bill for the next few months. You know, it's not like we're talking about taking chemotherapy that's going to make you lose all your hair and throw up for the next two months. Right, right. Well, thank you. Thank you. So I pretty much then uh, changing the diet would perhaps make some changes about... Uh, it, it's, the, you know, the diet, whatever is wrong with you, you need to eat a good diet. It's just like... Right. Uh, well, whatever, you understand. A good diet is fundamental to all healing. And some of what's done is not due to diet. And uh, some of the problems aren't due to diet. They're not going to respond to diet. And some is due to residual effects of our bad habits. Uh, yeah. And uh, But the diet, uh, you, you, you folks that are listening, and uh, the people that write me every day email on the email, people who get the newsletter, people who come to our clinics, I, I we know based on our research that we published that uh, nearly 90% of people reduce or stop their medications. Uh, people lose weight, uh, not just in seven days, but at the end of a year, we studied them. Uh, they lose weight. They have, they have permanent drops in cholesterol. Uh, so we've affected a lot of lives. It's just not enough. I got, I got an email just a couple of minutes ago uh, from, <laughs> before we started the show, from a pilot that flies for China Airlines. And uh, he changed his diet, oh, it was probably eight, 10 years ago because he had gout. And uh, anyways, his pilot's license was being threatened. And he just wrote me, he says, uh, you know, I fly for China, a China airline, maybe it was China Airways or whatever. He says, uh, I can tell you the pilots here in China are all scrambling because they're about ready to lose their uh, medical license to fly because of diabetes and high blood pressure. And uh, so, you know, the pilots are, are in as big a trouble in China as they are in the U.S. Uh, so this, this epidemic is spreading every place. Uh, the epidemic of food poisoning due to the Western diet. Right. And I've taken care of many pilots in the past. Uh, I'm a pilot myself, actually. Mary and I are both uh, twin-engine IFR-rated pilots who used to fly all over the country in all kinds of weather in our own plane. So I have a lot of interest in uh, airplanes. I've taken care of many pilots in the past, and they've been able to get their uh, a medical certificate back and able to start flying again. So maybe it'll happen in China. I mean, China's just uh, 35 years into this change. They can remember when people were well. The Chinese government and their dietary guidelines told the Chinese to cut their meat in half, whether, whereas the U.S. dietary guidelines are still promoting uh, the agribusinesses and uh, leaving the Americans to die of food poisoning. Dr. McDougall, there I had a, 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 an email from someone that um, asked me to please read this question in its entirety to make sure that uh, you understand the whole concept of the question. So here right. it goes. It says, rather than explain more about how to preserve a diseased kidney, please tell us, um, please tell all of us who are currently um, healthy, let's see, who I think she missed, but who tell us are currently healthy, the best version of McDougall diet to eat on a regular basis to preserve our kidney health. Since legumes are high in protein, please give us some concrete examples of meals to eat that meet the keep our kidney healthy requirement. Okay. Well, first of all, I think a normal healthy kidney function, somebody with normal kidney function can handle a cup of beans, peas, and lentils a day cooked. And that was, this has just been my guess for 40 years. I haven't changed it. Uh, I know vegetable protein is less harmful than animal protein. And of course, beans are vegetable protein. Uh, so you can have some beans, peas, and lentils. Mary and I include them in our diet. Uh, I wouldn't want you to, the problem is some people love beans so much they'd have beans, beans for breakfast, beans for lunch, and beans for dinner. And remember, they're 30% protein. You need about three, four, five percent of your calories is protein to maintain your body needs. No, certainly no more than 5%. Human breast milk, 
human breast milk, the greatest time of growth in your life is only 5% protein. So uh, when, when beans are 30% protein or six times as much, that protein has to be dealt with. And the human kidney, a healthy human kidney can deal with it in terms of vegetable protein. So I'm not telling you not to eat beans, peas, and lentils again. I'm telling you that they are rich in protein. And if you have kidney disease, you need to. What would be an ideal diet? Well, it's uh, the things that uh, that I, we've, I've taught you to eat for other problems like heart disease and diabetes and a good bowel movement and to get rid of your GERD. It's always starch-based. Remember, 70 to 90% of your food comes from starch. And you can pick any, any or many starches. You can pick rice if you want. You can pick sweet potatoes or potatoes or barley. Well, that's high in protein. So not barley. That'd be go with, with beans, peas, and lentils. How high is, I'd have to look up how high barley is in protein. But it's, a, it's not quite what beans, peas, and lentils are, but it's a little high in protein. Uh, you could, uh, you know, make wild rice, uh, all, all kind of corn, you're the center of your diet. But starch has to be the center of your diet. I, I and I, I've said that so many times, my teeth almost chatter that I've said it so much. It, starch needs to be 70, 90% of your diet. You don't measure, you just look at the plate. And then the rest of it uh, should be uh, non-starchy, green and yellow vegetables and, you know, maybe some fruits. And that's that's the ideal diet. What are examples? Well, uh, let's see, what's Mary fixing? Well, okay, Mary got some, we just got from, back from the store today. And uh, at our grocery, they have a, a bakery that does bake bread without any animal, animals or oil. It's just delicious. It is high in salt compared to our usual right. intake. You've heard my pitch on salt. So tonight we're having bread, and she is making a, a, a bean soup. Uh, a couple of days ago, we had mashed potatoes and corn with her uh, famous uh, gravy, yes. a little sriracha over the top. <laughs> and uh, oh, no, well, I thought we had a great meal. This was probably three nights ago. Uh, Mary gets these really dark purple sweet potatoes. Oh. And what we had is sweet potatoes and broccolini and a little bit of dilute peanut sauce over the top. I'll tell you, if you if you weren't satisfied by that, I mean, stomach full, appetite satisfied, pleasure taste buds satisfied, then <clears throat> you aren't trying. And uh, that was one of our meals. Now, of course, every morning we usually have uh, oatmeal and blueberries, just a habit. You could have hash brown potatoes if you wanted for breakfast. Be careful of these soy foods now. Remember, I've told you over and over again, you stay away from these soy hot dogs and Boca burgers and mm -hmm. uh, soy chickens and soy turkeys. These things are toxic with protein. And uh, they're just co concoctions of chemicals. Yeah. What, what, what that, about something like, uh, like for example, Satan? To, to, is that, would that be that'd harming be just, to the... That'd be similar, yeah, it'd be similar to isolated soy protein. That's isolated wheat protein. And uh, it puts a right. huge burden. We know from research that uh, both uh, gluten, isolated wheat protein and isolated soy protein, uh, they both uh, in, increase uh, loss of calcium from the kidneys. In other words, contribute to osteoporosis. They both do. The research says so. And uh, I've made that research available to people. Mm -hmm. and they also increase uh, uh, growth factor, which increases rate of cancer growth, uh, increases uh, aging, you age faster. It may also increase muscle growth factors, and they may increase bone strength, but what a price to pay, an increased risk of lung, brain, colon, prostate, breast cancer, by eating these high protein foods, including isolated wheat and isolated soy proteins. I, I would stay away from those things. Uh, at so best, now, in some of these high proteins that you're mentioning are included in not many, but some of the recipes that are on your website, uh, one of the uh, people wrote, would you say to have them on a very rare occasion or to just not have them at all? You know, I can, there may be in a phase where we use some, uh, some isolated soy protein foods and there may yeah. be a few recipes on the website, but you know, that was, it was a, a dark path I went down uh -huh. only very shortly. All so right. uh, would I recommend them on special occasions? Yeah. If you're going to have, say uh, this weekend, I told you we're having the whole family over and likely one of the meals we'll have is bean burritos. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know whether Mario still does it or not, but she might, remember we've got like 15 people here. She might put out some soy cheese as a side dish or uh, some soy based burger as a side dish. She has in the past, I don't know that she's done it in years, but you might do that, you know, if you have uh, some 
family members or friends who uh, think they're going to miss the cheese and the meat at the meal, you can fool them with these soy products. Again, they're not healthy, so uh, don't don't get the wrong message. If you see a discussion of me promoting any of these soy foods in the past, it was a uh, a short diversion from what uh, I know to be the truth. Right, right. Would would kidney issues lead to bone marrow cancer? And one of the people are asking. Is asking. Uh, I can't see any connection between bone marrow cancer and kidney disease, other than the common denominator. Okay. The common denominator being the Western diet. I think uh, things like uh, bone cancer are probably caused by uh, environmental chemicals, uh, pollutants mm -hmm. put in by industry, and of course uh, they uh, biomagnify as they go up the food chain. So you get these huge concentrations when you eat high on the food chain, which is, of course, animal products, fish, beef, chicken, dairy. They're eating at the top of the food chain. So then you get carcinogens, which are known to cause, in other words, initiate and promote cancer uh, by various means. Uh, so the, the common denominator would be uh, the Western diet. Uh, I'm trying to think of any uh, chemicals that would be directly nephrotoxic, kidney toxic, and there probably are. And right. that milieu of chemicals high on the food chain are probably many, many kidney toxic chemicals that you're consuming. The, the main, main problem would be uh, the autoimmune diseases I talked to you about, the molecular mimicry, which I showed you the paper on from the New England Journal of Medicine, mm -hmm. which should be the basis of a lawsuit. If you have a child who has kidney disease who wasn't told about this, you know, I tell you, I, I, you should be angry. Uh, the, the doctor has destroyed your family by failing to know about this, and there's no excuse. Again, we spent seven years, seven years going, learning how to take care of a human being. That's the minimum amount of training. And if you don't know about what a human being is supposed to eat, even in the face of the law that I got passed called SB 380, there's no excuse and you should be held liable because that child or an adult, his life is gonna be changed forever but they, I could go on. I mean, we could do like six hours of shows about how I feel my colleagues have done more harm than good to you. Mm -hmm. What purpose is there in that? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. my, my message is to stay away from these people. Get healthy and stay out of the business. Stay you don't out want of a the doctor as your friend. Get away from them. And the only way I know to get away from them is to fix the problem. And you know what the problem was? You the food. The, you know what the problem? Yes, yeah, the food. Right. Dr. McDougall, we did a little, a little while back ago, um, you, you talked in another webinar about yeast infections. Would you just mention, if, say a few words about this Vaginal topic? Yeast? Yeast is infection. That, well, first of all, generalized yeast infections or the yeast connection uh, is a fraud. Uh, people uh, who think that they're generally sick because of yeast are the same people who think they're generally sick because of gluten sensitivity. And I used to think the problem was hypoglycemia and I used to think the problem was they were neurotic and they were put on tranquilizers. You see, people feel bad. They feel horrible because they're being food poisoned and they look for different excuses like systemic yeast infection or hypoglycemia or they're neurotic or uh, gluten issues, which is the big phase now. I know why you're sick. You're sick because you're eating all the animals and oil. Uh, so, um, Systemic yeast infection in those terms is a, is a fraud and fallacy. Uh, people do get systemic yeast infections if, say, they have very immune compromising problems like, uh, like uh, HIV, uh, AIDS. Uh, then they get yeast infections that are systemic and if they are on cancer, cancer chemotherapy or when they're really sick with infection or you know, given lots of antibiotics, they get yeast infection. But otherwise, a healthy person does not get a yeast infection unless you're talking about a woman. Uh, vaginal yeast infections are very common. And they're common because, uh, because um, the vagina must be very sensitive to overgrowth. And when you eat the Western diet, which raises your blood sugar, even if you don't become frankly diabetic, the fat paralyzes the insulin activity, uh, the lack of carbohydrate makes insulin work less sufficient uh, in other words, eating the Western diet, high fat, low carbohydrate, makes you uh, pre-diabetic or frankly diabetic. And as a result, you have more sugar in your vagina, which the yeast love to eat. And uh, your, all, your immune system is all kind of compromised. 
So chronic yeast infections are common among women who eat the Western diet who are just a little fat, you know, or maybe they're trim because they starve themselves, but they still eat this immune suppressing, blood sugar raising uh, factors in the body, which allow the yeast to get really uh, excited about growing. They were very much able to grow. And so then you go to the pharmacy, you can buy it over the counter, you get something like monostat or other topical vaginal creams. You treat the problem, it stays away until you know, next week or next month. And so the way you deal with this kind of chronic yeast infection is you get yourself really fit and you get your sugars really where they ought to be. And uh, you get your immune system fighting like it should and then you won't have problems. It's not normal to have recurrent vaginal yeast infections. This is not a normal curse for the human female. And I, again, I see this in not just uh, vaginal issues, but overweight men and women. Uh, I'll see uh, uh, yeast infections in their skin, uh, particularly under their breasts, uh, in the folds of fat, say on their thighs or abdomen. What happens is these folds of fat, they collect moisture, which again encourages the growth of yeast. So getting rid of those folds of fat, again, will cure that skin yeast infection by a whole bunch of systemic means, as well as, as, well as stopping the moisture from collecting in the folds of fat. But the, these topical creams work, you can buy them over the counter, they're very effective, they're relatively safe, so don't hesitate to use them, but get the problem fixed, get your health back, and then you stop having these troubles. Right. Right. Uh, Dr. McDougall, someone is uh, really wanting me to ask you this question to see if you can give us a, a, a concise answer. We only have about four minutes. And the question is, my late friend's albumin protein levels, I believe, shortly before her death was an incredibly low one, yet she had chronic kidney disease, kidney stones, etc. How do you explain this? Well, this, uh, you know, when somebody, this is common for people we have kidney disease to have proteinuria. In other words, protein in their urine, which is uh, usually albumin. And the reason is, is because their kidneys are, are damaged. They're inflamed, like with the glomerulonephritis. Uh, they're uh, damaged as a result, they leak protein into the urine. The doctor's common response is that, well, what we need to do is feed more protein to replace the protein lost in the urine. That's 100% backwards advice. And it's talked about the way, the way in here with scientific references. So I talked about it 35 years ago about what nonsense that is, but they're still doing it. And of course that excess protein, as I told you before, is encouraging further kidney loss due to increased pressures and uh, flows through the nephrons. It's well established. And uh, the kinds of foods that they're eating are increasing the nephritis, as we talked about in this June 2011 New England Journal of Medicine article on how cow milk protein causes nephritis and nephrotic syndrome in children and is cured in all four of the kids that were so studied with immunofluorescence technology with beautiful pictures by taking them off the cow's milk. So they feed them more milk to give them more protein. It just makes the situation worse. So I'm not surprised your friend had albuminuria, but the treatment would have been not more protein, but less protein. The Kempner diet would have been ideal. Right, at that stage. right. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, symptoms of either prost uh, prostatitis, it says, or a UTI, but heard you say to stay away from things like prostate exams. What can I do to find out if this is what I have? Okay, I've already to, switched to plant-based diet. You have to remember when I discuss these things, there's a difference between using these tests for screening, that is taking right. healthy people and looking for disease. That's right. like mammography, PSA testing, digital rectal examination, colonoscopy. That's screening. You take a healthy person and you're looking for disease. The other way you use these instruments and this technology is to take sick people and try and further make a diagnosis. That's completely different, totally different than screening healthy people. So what do you do if you have prostatitis or think you have prostatitis? You may need to have an examination. You may need to have a urinalysis. You may need lots of things to, to make further diagnosis or help your doctor determine the right kind of treatment. You may, you may need urine cultures. Now there are lots of things that you may need uh, that fall into, you think, the category that I'm telling you stay away from for screening. That's not this case. Uh, right. So do make that distinctly clear. Prostatitis, again, I think is a dietary disease. 
as is benign prostatic hypertrophy, where you get a, a big scarred uh, prostate gland. Uh, that is talked about extensively in my website. Just go to the search in, engine and put in prostate or benign prostatic hypertrophy, and you'll see a good discussion on that. Yeah, yeah. Let's not forget that you have that wonderful feature on your website, everybody. It's the search feature, and you can find just about every topic there. Oh, you know, you don't. You really don't need me. You really right. I've written. I, I, as I told my son and uh, Dr. Anthony Lim and other people that think what I have to say is worthwhile. Uh, you really don't need me. I, I've written everything down for you, and I put it on video. Mm -hmm. So whatever becomes of interest to a dietitian out there or a physician right. out there or you know, just to save yourself and your family. I've, already, I've written it all down, and almost everything is free. And, uh, you know, the books are cheap. Oh, and by the <laughs> way, speaking of, book, speaking of books, you know, you still have time if you're into the holiday giving spirit. spirit. Oh, yes. Yeah, to get the healthiest diet on the planet, which, I, you know, as I say, uh, in many ways, uh, well, this is certainly the most beautiful and powerful book that I've ever written. Remember the color picture book section? So even your least interested relative will sit down and spend 15 minutes looking at color pictures. And uh, so it, it's a beautiful piece. Uh, I, I still tell you, and we still give out as our primary source, the starch solution to people who really are interested in, in learning the, uh, the dietary issues. But I've written 13 national best-selling books, and they're all different, but they all say the same thing. And no one has ever said to me, you wrote the same book over and over again. I didn't do that. I gave you a different way of communicating, a different point of view, and a different emphasis. So uh, just like I love all my children, I love yes. all 13 of our books. <laughs> While people are saying here that, yes, we do need you, and we need to see you. So <laughs> well, I'll, be, I'll be back. You know, all, everything planned. I'll be back next week. We'll talk about arthritis. And uh, that'll be just uh, after, I guess, just after Christmas. Yes. Uh, and just before New Year's, and uh, everybody will have been in the holiday spirit. I think you really need Doug Lyle. Yes, and that's right. Sins. You are forgiven, my son and daughter. <laughs> really, you are forgiven. We need Dr. Right now, Lyle on here, but I'll give you my blessings uh, uh, between the holidays, too. Uh, you know, try and take good care of yourself, uh, and also take it as an opportunity to share. Now, like Doug says, uh, when you meet people, you just take the attitude, well, it works for me. Or as you've met my beautiful wife, Mary, you know, they go, how in the world at 70 years old can you look so attractive and so healthy? Uh, so they just kind of stand there and people come to them. That's not me. That's not my personality. If I'm in a social event or someplace, it always comes around to what I'm interested in. You know, I like to listen to what other people's interests and passions are, but one way or another, either due to their fault or my impatience comes around to me some way or another and telling them that the reason that they or the relatives are in trouble is very simple. Uh, so whatever opportunity you have over the next couple of weeks, and you will have special emphasis because of gatherings at your business, at your, at your churches and synagogues and, and family events, you'll have, you'll have uh, increased contact with other people uh, in one way or another. Uh, try and open their eyes. Uh, we have a world to save. Uh, you have friends and relatives to save. We have companies to save. By the way, remember, I told you uh, the last time I was with you, we are focusing on companies like we take care of employees from Whole Foods and Sanctuary Link Communications. And we had, after my suggestion that you help us get involved with other companies like Apple and IBM and Ford and GM and medium-sized companies or whatever, let us take care of their employees. I actually got a response from somebody from Silicon Valley that said that she and her husband have big connections and they're going to be putting great effort into helping us reach the, reach the person. You have to reach the person that writes the paycheck, not the HR people. Right. That doesn't work. You got to write, get to the man or woman who writes the paycheck and says, this is costing our company tens of millions of dollars, which Dr. McDougall says is completely unnecessary and could put us as the leading computer company or grocery store in the world if we had healthy employees instead of sick ones. We can do that for you. But I need your help. I need you to go out and tell people that right, we offer need. that opportunity at our clinic. And, and also, I, I pleaded with you if you knew, knew any uh, political figures, because all my political friends are, are gone. <laughs> They'll be gone as of January 20th. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't have any friends uh, uh, anymore in the political party, but there have to be people 
uh, that are in the uh, the, the new uh, controlling governmental positions who care about the United States citizens. I, I have to believe no matter what your orientation is, you're, there's someplace deep on down inside of you that says that my job as a leader, as a government official, is to take care of the people of the United States. So introduce me to those people that I don't know who really want to take care of their, uh, their city, their state, their district, their country. And uh, let me give my point of view, because I need an introduction. Uh, they're being bombarded by garbage from the meat and dairy industry. And uh, they're gurus who write this complete nonsense and they don't know where to look. And they're so busy trying to get things done, they don't have the time to take care of your health. But remember, uh, the number one thing that people ask for in a writer's review, writer's review, I talked to you about this last time, it's the last month's newsletter. The number one thing that uh, people wanted Donald Trump to do in his first 100 days of pregnancy was to deal with health care. That's over immigration. That's over jobs. Wanted to, Mr. Trump to deal with health care. Well, if you're serious about this, then let's deal with health care. Let's show how people how to heal and stay healthy by fixing the problem. The problem is the food. So, ladies and gentlemen, if there's any way that you can help me, because my goal, I hope you can see it, Mary and my, my goals, as well as the rest of our people, not just those that are directly involved with us, but tens of thousands of followers out there. Our goal has been to help people in planet Earth. Uh, we, we've got to work together. So if anything you can do to help me help you and we get this thing moving along, if you, if you happen to be friends with uh, Mr. Trump, uh, give him a pull on his uh, protruding abdomen and tell him to come and <laughs> see me. I'll help him personally. Uh, I'll help the country. That, oh, this was another great time with you, Dr. Martugo. As always, we enjoy hearing you and, and, and your stories and, and all your information. And we look forward to next week. For another we'll great talking, topic. It all goes well. We'll talk about arthritis next week. And and uh, again, and the other thing to do, you know, I told you when you're socializing with friends and relatives, you might want to write down on a piece of paper, uh, drmcdougal.com, and then write webinars Thursday, 11 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, it's got to be painless to sit here and listen to me. Uh, you know, I, I can't imagine it being painful for people. Uh, oh, yeah, and nobody needs, needs to even know you're listening. You can even watch it afterwards. It's on the website. We get it up within six to 24 hours. So you can even hide in your closet and, and watch a McDougal webinar or a McDougal uh, uh, lecture that I gave or read a McDougal article. So you don't really have to come out of the closet. You can hide in the closet. <laughs> so write down a piece of paper, drmcdougal.com, look at his webinar or do his search right. and look up diabetes and you know, kind of s stick it in their coat pocket and walk away and maybe they'll find it couple months later and follow your advice. And Gustavo, I, again, you know, we've been doing this for two years. Uh, <laughs> you know, I say this with all sincerity, if it wasn't for you and only you, uh, we'd never be doing these webinars. So, so uh, I don't tell you enough how much I appreciate it. I hear from people all the time uh, that uh, they think of us as a team uh, out there with the, your, your focused way of asking questions and keeping the conversation on track. So yeah, if you don't hear it enough, I'll tell you, I hear a lot from people about how much they appreciate the contribution. And of course, uh, we'd never be here today if it wasn't, today if it wasn't for your uh, enthusiasm about webinars before you met me and your enthusiasm about uh, good health after you met me. So well, thank, thank you. you. It's an in my entire pleasure, and I hope to be doing this for the rest of my life. Thank you, Dr. Well, Michael. I've got, a, I've got at least a 10-year plan, so uh, you know, if you, <laughs> you're tired of listening to me, you better stop now, because I'm going to be around at least 10 more years. Okay. All right. Well, goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next week.